Good afternoon. My name is Chrissy Curran. I am the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer and Director of Oregon Heritage. And I want to take this uh, couple of minutes to welcome you to the first um, and hopefully only <laughs> a virtual Oregon Heritage Summit collaboration is key. Uh, while this is no substitute for being in person, we can still process sessions together. We can uh, hit it off with a new colleague. We can catch up over lunch. Um, and we are so pleased to see you all here and to be able to offer some great content on collaboration. First, a few technical items. You're probably uh, all used to this Zoom stuff uh, by now, but um, if not, just, um, just a couple notes. Please remain muted until called on. If you are willing to turn on your video, and I do see lots of faces uh, and networking moments, we would love to see your faces. It's a great way to connect. At question times, you may raise your hand or enter the question in chat. The chat feature can be seen when you move your mouse or touch your screen. It's the little speech bubble thingy. When you click on it, the chat will open on the right and you can enter questions at the bottom. The raise hand feature is the little hand and it will stay on. So um, when your question is answered, please click it again to, to put your hand down. Okay, well, I think uh, this year has shown us that we really are stronger together. The beginning of the pandemic had us supporting each other with sidewalk chalk and clanging pans. As closures continued and additional challenges mounted, we saw our heritage organizations rally together. Main Street started weekly calls. Oregon Museums Association coordinated with others to include museums in governor's conversation. Many shifted to online services to, to serve weary parents and bored people at home. Others coordinated with local organizations to provide service and to address so, social justice issues. The topic collaboration is key. Um, was actually, actually decided upon last March, but it couldn't be any more relevant today. We hope that you enjoy the sessions and leave inspired to increase your collaborative work and enhance your communities. To kick off the inspiration, we have a wonderful keynote speaker. We're super excited and honored to have Trina Michelle Robinson, who will present the call, recognizing the power in all of our stories. Michelle will share her experience exploring her family's enslaved ancestry, their liberation, and their migration to Chicago, a story she shared on The Moth Main Stage, which is a storytelling venue with a global audience. Her work focuses on the relationship between memory and migration through film, archival materials, and text. Welcome, Trina. Hi. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be joining you guys virtually. Um, I'm actually, um, I'm on the road right now. So that's why I have this little mask around my neck, just in case I get told to put it on. <laughs> I'm being sneaky right now. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about where I am um, when I'm done with uh, the story and before I start my presentation that's kind of related. Um, but I'll give that reveal in a little bit. Um, so yeah, so like, I'll start my moth story now. And like I said, I'll talk a little bit about my work after. So um, so one day I get this call from my mom and she tells me about this family photo album that all of a sudden turned up in the attic in the house next door to the home she grew up in on the south side of Chicago. Apparently about 50 or 60 years ago, there was a flood in her family's basement and they took everything next door to the house um, and they stored a bunch of things in their attic. And this photo album is one of the things that was left behind. It was one of those really old albums. It was starting to fall apart due to being lost in an attic for years. And it had a bunch of photos, like about 40 or 50 photos, of those old fashioned kind with those decorative decal cut edges. And my favorite was one of my great, great grandmother. Uh, she had her hand firmly planted 
on her left hip and her other hand was holding this large jar of something I assume she had just recently canned and she looked really tough and proud and it was awesome because I never got to meet her. So it was really cool to see a part of her personality. Well, um, in addition to all of those photos, the photo album had some newspaper articles from the 1930s. And one of them talked about my family's migration uh, in the 19, or actually the 1860s to Chicago. And the article said Kentucky, which I was a little confused by because that part of my family, I was always told came to Chicago from Boston. Um, I'm not sure where before then, but I was told um, before Chicago was Boston. So I just kind of attributed that to reporter error. And anyway, I was just completely overwhelmed because I had really no details about my family history at all. I knew some stories that they'd come to Chicago like years earlier um, before, the, like some, before the 1900s, but that's all I had. So this was crazy. So I just went down the genealogy rabbit hole. I started researching all the time. I created an account on ancestry.com and um, I was just constantly on there. I was looking up like city directories and uh, like census records. I saw where my great, great grandfather, David lived in the 1880s. And I saw the street his stepmother, Martha lived on in Chicago in the 1870s. So it was crazy, everything I was finding. It was really overwhelming, actually. But the one thing that did keep coming up was Kentucky. So, okay, time to face the music. There had to be some truth to this. So I took all the names that I found associated with Kentucky. Um, in particular, uh, there was a town called Mount Sterling, Kentucky in Montgomery County. And I found actually a message board on ancestry.com associated with this community. So I posted it all there. And then actually a few days later, I got contacted by the Erlanger Historical Society, which is in Northern Kentucky. And they, had, were, they were trying to find out what had happened to all these slaves. Now I, I knew my ancestors were enslaved, but I, just seeing that word next to my family member's name, that was a lot to process because that made it real, made history real. Uh, they had also attached in their message to me an estate inventory for a former Kentucky congressman named Richard French. Um, and it listed everything he owned. Um, it started off with uh, furniture um, in the house and then moved to farm equipment and animals. And the last category was titled Negroes. David, $300, Martha, $1,000. In addition to my great, great grandfather, David and his stepmother, Martha, were the names of about 14 other men, women, and children, my family. So yeah, so that was it, like that, it took a lot for me to have that fully sink in. Because like I said, I, I didn't have this kind of history. I didn't know anything about this at all. Like I said, I thought this part of my family was from Boston. So not only was I getting a narrative about my family, but it was completely changed uh, completely from what I thought I had with the little info I had. So I wanted to know who they were. Because I like I said, I never had this info. I needed to get close to them. So. Um, for a couple of years, I actually saved up enough money to fly me and my then boyfriend to Kentucky. And we flew into Northern Kentucky in Covington, Cincinnati airport. And we drove down to Mount Sterling. And as we were driving down, it was like a few hour drive. We, uh, like two hours, um, we were going through these little towns and I noticed that we were getting these really hard looks and stares. And then it became clear just because my boyfriend was white. <laughs> and I guess that was something that's not that familiar in some of these towns. We were living in New York at the time, which is made, there was no big deal, you know, but here apparently it was. So we were just, okay, note to self, like this is an issue here. So anyway, when we were planning this trip, um, we were um, planning, we were in contact with the Montgomery County Historical Society. Uh, Richard French, he had a home in Northern Kentucky where that first historical society contacted me. And then um, at the, where the main homestead was in central Kentucky, uh, Mount Sterling. 
So the Montgomery County Historical Society, they said, you know, this is a really rural place, small town, you know, it's probably not best for you to do this by yourself. So we'll guide you, we'll have someone take you around. I'm like, okay, great. This is going to make life so much easier. Awesome. So we get into Mount Sterling and we pull into this mini mall and we met up with Scott and Joanna Davidson. There was this cute elderly couple. They were awesome. We chatted them up in the parking lot. You know, they just had their Sunday morning church service and totally sweet. I said, okay, all right. So get your pick, get your car and pull up behind our pickup and we'll be on our way. And we're like, great, this is easy. So we get in our car and we pull up behind the pickup and all I see is a flash of red. Blue is the stars and bars of the Confederate flag on the back of their truck. Now, the only thing I associate with that flag is violence. And it's the same violence that caused my family to leave this community and completely wipe it from our family narrative. And here I was following it back, following that flag back into town. This is not smart. So we were sitting there in our car, just freaking out, like not moving. Like, what are we gonna do? And then like, ever since back and forth, I was just like, okay, wait, let's pull ourselves together. I mean, they're elderly. What are they gonna actually do to us? So we just kind of, like I said, pulled ourselves together. My boyfriend hit the gas and we were off. So we're driving for a while on the interstate and then we pull off onto this tiny quiet road and the landscape completely changed. It was as if we completely went back in time. Everything was really still and quiet. The houses were really far apart from one another, mostly all perched up on these hilltops. There were largely these big, brick structures. Uh, one home even had an antique hitching post beside some carriage steps out front. I mean, my face was just glued to the window, just taking this all in. And we finally get to the homestead where my family was enslaved. And we are um, walking around where the main house used to be. And it was, the house was long gone, the main home. And it was largely, it was overgrown with like wildflowers and tall grass and we're milling about and Scott, you know, pulls me aside and he starts pointing out like the native trees and plants, trying to get me an idea of what my ancestors might have seen when they lived there. So I'm just taking in these beautiful ancient oak trees and cherry trees and goldenrod. It was fall and you know, everything was beginning to fade, but they glowed when hit by the sun and it was just so beautiful. I hated it because how could beauty live here? We finally get to the main place Scott wanted to take us to. And it was this family cemetery, private family cemetery of the Frenches. And, you know, there was a cluster of marble uh, headstones white marble headstones, you know, some of them had fallen over due to years of neglect. And I'm just taking them in, like looking at the sentiments carved into them. And Scott, again, grabs me and tries to get my attention. He's pointing to this pile of rocks. And he said, no, this is not a pile of rocks. If you look closely, they are embedded in the earth. Those are field stones, which would be markers for the slave graves. And that would be my family. So it took me a while for that to sink in and I'm just staring, trying to process. And I turn back to my left and I'm looking at those beautiful, large pieces of marble. One is eight feet tall and it's for that man, Richard French, who, whose name was on that estate inventory. And it was this eight foot tall obelisk completely shadowing the graves of my ancestors. Like they were completely invisible, like they didn't matter. And then it hit me like, it's getting dark. I do not want to be here after dark in this town. So my boyfriend and I, you know, we're like, okay, let's go. And we, we just had to say our goodbyes. And we just got back on the road, trying to take in everything we had just experienced. And we're driving down the road. And I start realizing that this is the road that my great, great, great grandfather Martin drove down or left town on when he left the area for the last time. See, he was freed in a will in 1856. The will actually said that he was to go out free. And he actually didn't go far. He went to Covington in Northern Kentucky, right across the river from Cincinnati. And he worked there for several years. 
and he saved up enough money to return to Mount Sterling and he purchased his wife Martha and several of his children and they actually settled not far away um, in Winchester, Kentucky and they eventually migrated to Chicago in 1866. So anyway, uh, you'd think I'd be satisfied after getting all this information, but I was not. I needed to know more. I just wanted to just get even closer to them because I just like, okay, if I found out this, I could find out more. So I started going to all these courthouses, university archives. I was doing tons of internet searches. And one of my internet searches actually turned up a personal check for Richard French, the name of that man who was on the, um, whose name was on that estate inventory. And I was just like, oh, this is random. And I was like, well, maybe I should just get this. So I contacted, it was like an online auction site. And I asked about the check and they said, you know what? They no longer had it, but it never sold. And he gave me the name of the man who did put it up for sale. And um, I contacted him and not only do you still have that check, he had about 40 other documents, three of them original slave records related to my family which is unheard of. I mean, it's hard to get original slave records to begin with, but related to your family, like that's just next to impossible. So I said, yes, yes, I will, I will take these records. There, was, there were tax records, two of them were tax records that listed, the, um, that listed horses, the number of acres he owned and blacks. And the other record said, it was a bill of sale for a woman named Anne being sold from one brother to another. So I said, like, I will take these, thanks. And he said, um, you know what, actually, I didn't want these documents. These were part of a larger lot and I had to buy them and I, I want my money back. So that's going to be 40, uh, so that'll be 4,000 for all of them. And I was just like, no, no, I, I, I only want the slave records listing my family. Okay. And no. So next we started haggling. We we're going back and forth, saying different numbers, and we finally settled on me paying $3,600, and he allowed me to pay in installments, which is obscene, but I was just like, whatever. Again, like, I couldn't walk away from this. I mean, it's a slave records related to my family, like I said, unheard of. So it's like, fine. So I'm at home, and I'm waiting for the records to come, and I pick the perfect wall I'm gonna hang them on. I was gonna get them professionally framed using museum quality glass. And um, they finally come and I open up the package and I pull out the bill of sale for Anne and I'm holding it in my hands and I start getting nauseous. And I realize it feels like I'm holding the souls of my ancestors in my hands and it burns. So the violence of slavery doesn't just exist in the whip against bare skin. It exists when you just simply put a dollar sign beside somebody's name or passing someone's soul from one brother to another. I took that document. I put it back in its plastic sleeve. I went to my closet. I pulled out a black metal lockbox and I put them all inside and I've really taken them out. Not now, I'm just not comfortable looking at those every day. But I, I do take comfort knowing though that they are home and I'm gonna take care of them. They're with family. So I'm actually currently working with the Montgomery County Historical Society about putting a marker up in the cemetery, acknowledging the existence of the African Americans, my family who had lived and worked and many who had died in that space. And um, one of them said to me, you know what, do we really need to do this? I mean, we're going to be the only ones who knows that this is here. And I said, oh, no, no, we are doing this. I want their names written down, cast in bronze, and said out loud, David, Martha, Martin, Anne. These mothers, daughters, fathers, and sons are loved. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so that's the story I told about the moth. That's the story of me tracing my family. Um, and that's actually where I am right now. I am in Mount Sterling. I'm here doing research, additional research. I come here every couple of years. 
um, uh, today I was actually in the courthouse trying to get better copies of those documents. Um, it's proving to be a little bit difficult, <laughs> but I'm in the process of doing that now. And uh, um, yeah, so that's where I am. That's why I have to, I'm sitting in a public library <laughs> like in the middle of nowhere. So um, yeah, so that's the, my story. So let me now, I'll share a, a presentation and I'm gonna talk a little bit about like my journey, how I um, started researching what I found and how it's been a collaborative process and how I started actually being able to present, um, you know, my Stelmi story as a, um, through storytelling. Um, so, yeah, so um, first of all, I want to start off actually with this slide right here. This slide um, is actually uh, from a short uh, video essay that I made about my, my experience, Tracy, my family history it incorporates a bunch of uh, documents and um, film footage from the, the site where my family enslaved. The images and the words, the call, that's, uh, there's a tiny little creek on the property. Um, and this is just a piece of the creek and I just wanted to kind of made like the titles come to life. So that's actually what this image is. Um, Trina, sorry what? to interrupt. Your screen is not showing for- Oh, it's not? Hmm. Or it's not for me anyway. Okay, let me, let me go back. Let me, let me go back. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Let me go back. Let me start that again. Okay, let's see if this works. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, so yes, yeah, so this is that screen I was telling you about with the image of the creek and the lettering for this video essay that I created. And um, throughout this uh, presentation, the, this image that's going to be on the far side, that's a, a part of the um, the place, the, the property where I visited. And again, it's pretty much untouched. It, you can very much imagine what it must have been like to live there. And it is very wild how fright, it's frightening how beautiful it is, but it's amidst such ugliness in terms of history. Um, so yeah, so I'll just go a little bit into my background um, and like I said, uh, storytelling and then just like some of my storytelling influences and like what I studied, I guess, <laughs> to um, get learn how to put my message across uh, succinctly. Um, yeah, so let's change. Oh, okay, so yeah, so background, the family story. Where did it come from? Um, like I said, it all started from that family photo album. It was like a seemingly like, nothing event, okay? Like very simple, didn't know this would completely transform my life. Um, like I said, uh, it was about 20 years ago. Um, and this album basically was holding our family secrets. And there's newspaper clippings. The one that I mentioned was from January 9th, 1932. And it was reporting the death of one of my ancestors. And it said that they had come from Kentucky in the 1860s. Um, and uh, like I said, none of this was part of my family narrative. It was all a shock. We knew that my family had been in Chicago early on, but you know, it was just great to finally be able to get the dates, but and the actual real connection to Kentucky. Um, and additional research, years of research turned up many more articles and census records and all these things that confirm the roots. And this event really changed the course of my life. My I'm not even remotely in the same place. Uh, in any way, shape or form, even like with, with jobs, like I have a totally different career now. Um, so when I found all this info, like I just became completely obsessed. Um, it, like I said, changed my life. I wanted to literally see the world through my ancestors' eyes on a deeper level. I wanted to walk in their shoes. And I did this basically through like a series of sensory experiences. You know, I just was not satisfied with just looking at things on the paper. You know, like I said, I walked the footsteps of my ancestors by visiting where they had lived, not just Kentucky, but, you know, um, different places in California they had migrated to in the early 1900s. And um, actually even was in Virginia where they had come. I'm still trying to track the details about that, but they had come from from Virginia to Kentucky, I started collecting heirloom seeds and planting some of the vegetables to imagine what they might have personally cooked and grown in their own gardens, just so I could taste what they might have eaten. And I started, you know, it was also so much about touch and I was like collecting original manuscripts like you heard in that story. And um, actually dirt too, when I'm talking about touch, I have like dirt samples from many, from Mount Sterling, from Berea and here in Kentucky where they went to school. Some of, where my great, great grandfather went to school beginning in the, in 1868. 
Um, uh, so yeah, I, it was all about the sensory experience for me. So it was basically, um, before I started doing the storytelling, it was a little over 10 years worth of research, um, well over 10 years worth of research. And I just had so much stuff. I have like boxes and bags of like papers and things that I've collected and it was a little bit crazy. Like how do I uh, sift through all of this? Um, so backtracking a little bit to talking about this research and all the documentation, I wouldn't have gotten any of this if I hadn't been working with other people and the idea of collaboration. Like that, that that's just, it would have been an impossible feat. <laughs> I worked with countless researchers all over the country, archivists, genealogists, government agencies, um, uh, like historical societies, you, you name it. Like I was working with people. Um, like I said, I didn't even know about, that was the historical society that even told me, that first gave me that initial kernel of information that would connect me to Mount Sterling. Um, and then once I, once I started getting the information and the details of my ancestor story, and I was starting to process it and I was ready to tell my story, I realized, you know, I was looking, you know, the best way to do it. And um, I actually was working with storytelling coaches and teachers. I had a director at the Moth, you know, in different organizations to get the word out. So again, this, it really took a village to bring the story to life. It's all about, there's no way I could have done this by myself. So uh, the, especially if somebody with, um, of, you know, African-American descent in this country, descendant of slaves, it's so hard. Cause I mean, it's just, there's so many government records you actually have to go through because we were property, unfortunately. And you, you, it's a horrible truth to face, but like you do have to rely on courthouse records and things like that to um, get a lot of information. So again, it's seriously about collaboration. So that first kernel, that, that uh, email that, or that uh, message board on ancestry.com, this, <laughs> this is that message. Um, I got that breakthrough was on May 29th of 2009 and I posted it to ancestry.com and this woman Lisa and the Erlanger Historical Society sent me this message with the names that match um, most of my names. And um, this is a, the document, a part of the document on that, where I talk about that section that mentioned Negroes, this was it. Um, this is that section. And it was wild just to see family members' names here. Uh, it was just a lot to take in. But it was unbelievable that I was able to find that. And like I said, um, there's two homesteads they lived in. Um, Erlanger, like I said, that was the Erlanger Historical, um, Historical Society. That's in Kenton County in Northern Kentucky. It's not far from Cincinnati. Um, but where they, the main um, homestead was in Mount Sterling, Kentucky, in Central Kentucky, in Montgomery County, Kentucky. And um, James French was the initial owner, um, war veteran, you know, Kentucky settler at Fort Boonesboro, his son. And this is the, a, a piece of the will that says, uh, you know, to our daughter, Theodosia Hood and her heirs, I give after the death of my wife, the man slave Martin until the first day of January in the year of 18. 58, 56, then Martin to go out free. And that will is dated September 5th, 1834. So he still had to be a slave. <laughs> he was not freed for another almost 20 years or more than 20 years, which also showed, you know, yes, there was people who did free people in wills like this, but they pretty much worked them until they didn't have, you know, <laughs> much left, unfortunately. You know, it wasn't the most, um, it wasn't a fully lovely gesture. Um, uh, and this is Richard French, the name the, on that estate inventory. This is the son of that, that settler of Kentucky, James French. Um, and this, uh, so yeah, so, um, so as I talk about that, Will, you know, he used to go out free and here he was living free in 1860, working as a plasterer or, that, or a whitewasher in Covington. Um, in 1860, the 1870 census says he was listed as a plasterer also in Chicago. And here he is with some family members and other people. Um, and this is the bill of, this is the sale document when he purchased his wife. I, I, I still can't believe this. I was actually in the courthouse today trying to get a better copy of this because this is the really awful copy I have and I wanted to get something more clear. And I'm that, that's been a bit difficult. Um, they are not really being very flexible right now. So, and I'm waiting to hear, they have actually, you know, 
something they have like the original document the, the, the original ledger but they also have the original um documents that were brought to the courthouse in their archives they're just don't like to go touch the archives so i like kind of raised the stink today i'm like I, these are my ancestors please just give me a photo or something a, a better document a better copy of this um and then they migrated to chicago in the 18 in 1866 and this is the 1870 census which is which is interesting that I, you know mistakenly identifies them as white which happens a lot in these census records is misinformation they probably just saw one person who was very fair skin and just like okay they're all white that's it but no um and you can see on top he's listed as a plasterer um and he died in 1871 and is buried in a family plot that we have um in forest home cemetery uh it's not it's former of all time cemetery it was a german cemetery within it you know started accepting all types of people it's integrated um and it was wild you know just discover this um marker here is almost a duplicate of the one of richard french um again this is it's even taller than richard french's was it's probably like maybe 10 feet tall it was unbelievable like it's almost like they wanted to top him which i think is pretty fantastic um and this is uh, another family member of his this is a uh, one of his sons um my great great grandfather's brother who was very successful here he um ran a cotton and corn ranch in, in oklahoma but he was also appointed by the illinois governor to a state industrial commission in 1922 and he was really successful well known in chicago um and again it just shows um it's just interesting like it's just these people were former slaves like these are there were slaves as children and you know these people ended up becoming incredibly successful once they went um to chicago uh this is martin's son martin v french and he was one of the earliest african-american police officers in chicago and served for 38 years so anyway so why did i choose to do storytelling um i just would tell people this story of how I was able to uncover all this information. And people were like, excuse me, what? Like, that's not normal. This is very shocking. <laughs> like you need to tell people. And also like telling people I was told would help other people to realize maybe I should try this. I can actually do this. Cause it just, it's very daunting for an African-American American in terms of this kind of history. Cause we just often think, you know, it's just impossible. Like there are so many roadblocks, but people were convincing me, no, you need to let people know that it is possible. It just might take a little bit more work. And um, like I said, so people were generally had a big reaction immediately connected to my story personally, because um, they would relate their own family's migration story. You know, we all have migration stories in our bloodline. Um, not, it might not be you, but it might be your grandparents, great grandparents. So we all have that connection to migration. Um, and then I also had this desire to connect to traditional storytelling methods, storytelling methods um, especially that of the griot. Like I grew up as a kid going to um, African-American storyteller programming and events in Chicago, like African folk tales and things. And those African folk te tellers, especially traditionally in West Africa were referred to as griots. Um, um, but the ultimate goal, like I really wanted to build um, like strong connections and create community. Like I said, I wanted people to be able to see themselves in one another and feel comfortable sharing and creating a dialogue. And again, like have other people see their own migration stories in mine. So um, I did the moth. Uh, that was like the biggest storytelling event that I had did. I had, it's, uh, I did the moth main stage. There are different versions of the moth. Um, the main stage is the terrain. Um, it's like an event that usually has five storytellers they tour or they do um smaller events there's the story slam that's where you can sign up and put your name in the hat and then i'm forgetting what the other one is i think it's like an education program um so um yeah and yeah and they also do programs like international programs like it's like i have here london and australia south africa kenya and they do programming um annually with the united nations and they have a npr show on podcast so um, the Moth main stage, uh, it's a year, it took a year and a half for, for from pitch to me getting on stage. Um, I pitched a two minute story. They have an online pitch line actually. Um, and I was contacted by a curator and she was screening me and I got referred to one of the directors who actually was from Kentucky. And um, we bonded on that. And uh, 
of, I started touring. My first show was in New York's Lincoln Center. And then I toured and did Portland, Greenwich, Connecticut, Omaha, Nebraska, which was interesting. And then um, San Francisco and then aired on NPR um, on the Moth Radio Hour in 2019. On one interesting note, um, my director, we found out backstage, you know, she, she knew that her family was from central Kentucky and she started doing more research and basically backstage at that Lincoln Center show you know, because she was trying to get to the nuts of it and the the root of her connection and um, backstage behind that show, you know, we're getting closer and closer and she reveals like she pulled out her ancestry.com account and her name, her ancestor's name was on that, that um, tax record that I had, that I was able to purchase. And it was crazy. It was like the stars aligned and we're all meant to be connected and like work together to get, um, not just have a kumbaya moment, but to actually get and do the work of racial healing and uh, social justice and stuff. So that was a really wild, crazy story and coincidence revealed backstage. We actually got that confirmed with us, somebody from the um, historical society here. Um, so, um, so getting started, um, like if you, you know, if you want to be able to tell your, if you want to be able to process some kind of event like this for yourself, like, how do you do this? Cause like, um, like we all have, we all have all these, we all have a great story. We all do, you know, it's just like, you try to mine your memory for um, something that really is kind of unique. Like what are people always asking you about? Like, or having a what moment when they, <laughs> when you tell them, um, look for the details. Uh, when I found the story I wanted to work on, I worked with the director at the beginning by telling her every single detail of the story, no matter how seemingly minor it might be well, that I thought it might be like the description of the landscape of the town. Um, like that came from these conversations. Cause like where I was just telling her the story and she's like, but no, stop. What did it look like? What did you hear? You know, what were the sounds in the area and the, the detail about the original slave records? I was just saying that in passing and she's like, Oh wait, no, 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 that's huge. And so she's the one who added that part of the story. Cause that wasn't a part of the original story for me. Um, so it's just like really mining those details. Um, and then think about like why, whether people care about my personal story. That's the big question. Cause like we, you know, a lot of us, we find these genealogy stories and they're so interesting but they might not be that interesting to other people. So you have to learn how to yeah. um, creating it for yourself to making other people, um, finding a way for other people to connect to it. And that requires serious editing and reflection. Um, uh, again, like I was in the beginning, I was processing over 10 years of research. That's a lot, <laughs> so, but I wanted to connect. So, and, and have people see themselves. So like, you know, how, um, you have to identify like what that story is about, uh, what the, once you identify the subject, figure out like, what is the story really about? And for me, it was the universal theme of migration. I was, and heavily focused on identity. So the common elements of a migration story, persecution in a family's homeland, seeking safety, creating a new life and identity. And these are all elements in that story. And I could use that to connect to other people. Um, so um, yeah, so it's the migration element of my story. When a family seeks safety from the terrors of the past enslavement, they move north, basically erasing their lives in Kentucky from their family narrative. They successfully create new lives, but not um, by not holding on to the past. And so I bring the story to the present to include my journey. Generations later, their ancestors discovers the truth and is desperate to uncover as many details as possible. And she wants to give them a voice while at the same time helping her reshape her own identity. So um, like I said, all, all of us have a migration story that can impact our identity. Um, that, 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 you know, when we learn it can impact our identity, whether intentionally or not. Um, like, like I said, this really shaped the complete trajectory of my life. Um, and I can talk to you a little bit about that, but just, you know, it's just like mining those details. And, uh, you know, my thing was, like I said, it's about migration and identity. That's, that was my story. So again, like, again, like getting to the root of it, like, how do you get started? What's at stake? Like, in other words, what are you risking? How do you keep your audience engaged? Raising the stakes of your story makes your story more interesting and compelling and gets people to want to listen to it. Um, the quote uh, right here is the example uh, of one of the main stakes. I, my family had left this community because of the violence associated with that flag. And here I am following that flag, not smart. 
again, like that was like a moment of danger for me, deep fear of, and violence. Um, I was raising the stakes and making people, um, helping people be more curious about what was next, like keep people, keep people on the edge and then putting it together. I, how do you create this story? Um, option one, you can write an outline of the story. It's way more spontaneous. It's a flexible way to tell your story from the start, especially when editing. Um, it's great to not be tied down, tied down to particular words and rephrasing once you get your story locked down and are preparing for the stage. I so say you just write out an outline about the major points of the story. So that way it's just like, it's just so much more easy in the telling and you just remember those bullet points. The option two is to write the story out fully and edit. That's great for stories as well, um, especially for longer stories that might need more structure. But there's a huge risk if you want to go this storytelling route with your story, because there's a chance that the storyteller will become dependent on particular words and phrases and not being able to sound natural or relax at all when telling the story. And um, it might sound like you're reciting an essay, you know, at certain points. Um, additional tips if you want to tell a story, you want to get into storytelling, um, show, don't tell. Um, the quote right here is an example of that, about being descriptive, you know, it's adding color. You know, we finally get to the homestead where my family were slaves. There were these beautiful ancient oak trees and cherry trees and goldenrod. It was fall, so they were starting to fade, but when they were hit by the sun, they were just so beautiful. I hated it, because how could beauty live here? Um, this is uh, an image that the moth used to promote the story. So again, it's just like adding color. Um, I want them to be able to see what I'm experiencing as it happened and come with the journey, come along with me on the journey. Again, be in the moment, um, see the events as you're telling your story. Additional tips, there's linear versus non-linear storytelling. Some stories, the storyteller might jump around in time and not tell the story in the order that the, the, the things happened, the events happened. It's an awesome way to tell a story. You know, it's a great way to add tension and capture um, an audience's attention, but it's very tricky um, and can be very difficult to pull off successfully because it might be confusing to the listener and hard for them to follow. So it's always safer to tell a linear story. Um, earlier versions of my story were non-linear. I actually started in the cemetery in my story and um, my director was just like, no, no, let's start at the beginning. Um, so also listen to yourself, record your story and practice and practicing to review timing, pacing, the story itself, rehearse in front of people, telling your story, even just one or two people can help you prep, you know, just, you just get used to being in front of people. And like I said, reach out to a storytelling coach or instructor, um, especially if you're new to storytelling. It just makes things so much easier, um, the process easier, you gain more confidence, I think, at least for me. And then um, finally, I wanted to include some, like, some influences and resources here, because uh, I, I really, want people, I really am encouraging people to try to tell their family stories and connect with people. The Moth has is a great resource and they have so many um, uh, for, for, that you can listen to on their podcast and also their YouTube channel. Um, I have a couple here that I want to mention. John Tatura's story, as you can imagine, is one of the best Moth stories ever. He's focusing on a family member's mental illness and also um, intertwined with the 2003 blackout. So he was actually able to really, you know, to, to relate his family story to a, a huge event. That's a, that's a nice tactic. It's a great story. It's like 18 minutes long, which is long, but you don't feel it because he's just such a great storyteller. Um, and these are other examples of family stories um, that people have told like a genealogist, or I'm sorry, a, a, gen a geneticist who stole, told a story. Um, Malcolm Gladwell has told some stories. Um, and yeah, so these are just some other examples of stories and then some other, other storytelling outlets like Snap Judgment, This American Life, um, Mortified, which is kind of relating to like, you're reading like your childhood diaries or just like horrible, like traumatic things from childhood that are actually now funny when you look back. And then there's a story collider, which is based, which focuses on science-based stories. So anyway, um, that's my presentation. I just really want to encourage people um, to get out there and do that and maybe encourage it in your communities to get people more interested in history. Um, yeah, get your communities involved. <laughs> and yeah, so that's, that's my story. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Trina.
<clears throat> um, if it's okay, we do have some time for, for questions. So I can um, read the chat for you. Uh, so folks who have questions, if you wanna write in um, the chat your question, or if you would like to raise your hand, you can click on reactions and click the raise hand button and I can look for that as well. Give you a couple seconds to respond. I'm clicking through to see the hands. No worries. Yeah, this was so much fun. Thank you so much. Person. <laughs> I know, me too. Me too. And I love Portland. I told my story in Portland. I was <laughs> <laughs> So Eliza, would you like to ask a question? Yeah. Are you unmuted? We can't hear you if you're asking, Eliza. Hello? Yeah. There we go. We got you now. Sorry, Zoom wants me to test my microphone every time <laughs> I want to use it. So um, <laughs> thanks so much for sharing your story with us. It was really um fascinating to hear and I appreciate the tenacity and the joy and also the amount of pain that you shared with us so I want to thank you for that and one of the things I was thinking about um I, I work at an institution that often um, invites people to come and talk about their history and to talk about the knowledge that they have and one of the things that we are always mindful of is um the appropriate way to make those invitations and the appropriate compensation to offer. And I was listening to you talk about all the, the different places that you told your story for the moth and it being on NPR. And just um, just what insights do you have for those of us who are inviting speakers and asking people to tell um, these stories that are personal and often are painful? What are What is the right way and what's the wrong way to make those invitations? And where can we find good information about the kind of compensation to offer that is um, respectful um, so that's that we can great. build the right budgets? <laughs> no, that's a great question. And um, one, uh, I'll answer the second one first. I think like when you want to understand, like get an idea about compensation, I would reach out to other organizations you know who are already doing it. I think um, especially like different types of organizations will pay differently, like historical societies and. Um, government agencies will pay differently than like a private organization um and like i know some people who do do storytelling for like corporate things as well which is like a whole other <laughs> ball game so i would i would just honestly like reach out to an organization that's similar to yours and i, I think that's a, a great thing would be to ask um I, and i think also a great idea I would even email the moth people because they could actually give you that ballpark range for the different because they actually they do so many things they even do trainings for corporate events or for you know for corporations for storytelling they do I mean they work with so many different types of budgets and levels and they're the nicest people in the world <laughs> and they would definitely help you with that so I would reach out to a moth um to the moth staff and actually I could I could send I could forward like somebody uh, an email for you for that too if you'd be interested because they could definitely help you with that and the first question about when you initially reach out to people um well if you already know the story i think like the best way is to say that is to talk about how you and your organization find the real actual human connection to it um and try not to like focus so much on the i mean you definitely focus on call out the pain but don't make it be this like we're taking don't have it phrase it in a way that the other person might look at it, at it as this is oh this is you know they just want to hear another slave story or something like that or like, like just they want to focus on the pain like focus on the connection like why you why you wanted to talk to them in the first place it's about that human connection so i think that's that's the best way to do it um for sure thank you for that thank you yeah, thank you. That's great advice. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Trina. We do have a question in chat. It says, what advice would you like to give to those museum slash archivist type folks about which you're talking to a bunch of us <laughs> about how to make this kind of research easier? Mm, that's such a great question. Well, the first thing, um, which is like, it's totally changing the game right now is digitizing stuff. <laughs> um, because a lot of the stuff is not digitized, obviously, um, but like more and more now things are becoming digitized, like especially right now this courthouse I go to, 
um, I think you can look it all up online now before you come there. Like you can, you know, you can't look at the image, but you can type in a name on their website, you know, and like they can tell you like what, if they have anything related and like what call book, you know, what, what, um, what deed book or something it'll be in. So like, you know, one digitizing is a great way. And if you can't do that, I think the next best way is just to create like some kind of binder system where you have things organized in that way. Cause, um, that, you know, because that'll just help, you know, put point people in the right direction much easier, you know, if they, okay, I can go look at these, these books here rather than like, oh my God, that overwhelming daunting task of just like looking at a room full of documents and like, you know, <laughs> so just like, you know, just doing the best you can to just like make things as simplified as possible, but like digitizing. And I think that requires maybe like hiring interns, like, <laughs> you know, that might be a lot or like volunteers in your community, you know, and like make it like this event, you know, like, you know, this community building event for something like that. Cause I know a lot of people do stuff like that. They you know, make it like community building type event for like the art, for the um, digitizing process. So um, yeah, that's a great question. Great, thanks. Um, okay, you talked about doing the work of social justice. The research you've done and shared feels like tangible products how can cultural institutions leverage these product products, sorry, and stories of one person to do the work? What do you think is the role of museums in doing the work of social justice? That's an amazing question. I'm actually working on, that's one of the reasons I'm back in town right now. Um, I got a grant <laughs> actually through the Kellogg Foundation and UVA um, to uh, work with a community um, based, and it started with my story. Um, by helping to uncover the stories of African Americans in this community. And rather than focusing on like the fire, like a school that was burned down, like talk about these things. Because like the one, well, first of all, there's two things. First, you do need to talk about the, those stories um, and not bury them. Because um, lots of story, lots of these small towns, like where I am, like they don't even like to tell, talk about these schools, these black schools that were burned to the ground. Um, so one and all, like talk about the, these stories and contextualize them, but then also look for the, the um, look for the businessmen, look for the African American leaders, look for the Union soldiers. You know, this is another project we're working on here. There's a there's a bunch of African American Union soldiers in the cemetery here that nobody knew about, you know, and nobody talks about. So like find a way to talk about that and like we're working on maybe trying to do a memorial but like have some kind of programming involved about like spotlighting some of these people's names like even if you just do like three people like that's a great start to get people to engage with history and social justice and like once you start talking about these stories it's like okay we're seen that's the whole thing it's like we're, we're not often seen by so many people and especially like smaller communities and even I'm talking about like not even just African Americans, but marginalized people in general. Like we need our stories told. We need our names told. You know, like said out loud. Like we are people. Like just like you, we have diverse stories as well. So please just say our names and tell our stories. You know, and just start small. Do one or two, and then like you can build programming from that. And like again, like relate it to like why we are where we are now in our society. Like we're not talking about this stuff. We're not talking about the, the negative stuff. We're not talking about the bad stuff. We're not talking about anything. Once we start talking, we'll start moving forward. Thank you. Uh, let's see, here's another one. What was, your, what was your background and how has this process experience landed you in your new endeavors? Oh, okay. Yeah. So I used to work in magazine publishing for a long time. I worked in the production. I was a production director working with the layouts and like the printer and stuff. And, uh, and then I worked at a tech company. I got recruited by a tech company to work on their editorial team and the web stuff. And then now I'm actually getting my MFA in um, fine art. Um, I focus on film and uh, print media, which is very much related to my magazine background, but now it's, I'm pursuing a more fine art background in terms of print. And um, I've been making a series of films uh, originally focused on my story, but not like my work focuses on the relationship between memory and migration. So I explore that, th those topics through art and through the visual arts. So that's where I am now. And I'm, when I graduate, I have one more year. Um, I want, I ideally would like to get a job in research, um, a job doing research um, in some kind of institution 
focusing on African American history, ideally, but just, you know, I want to help other people find stories and bring them actually to the art world, too, but also other institutions, agencies, just people in general, I want to uncover stories. Great, thank you. Um, do you have, this might be the last one here. So do you have um, suggestions on how to encourage people to come forward with stories that are not often told or tend to be hidden? How do we encourage it and make a safe place for someone to tell their story? Uh, that's a great question. Um, oh, that's a really hard question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, yikes. Yeah, that's a hard one. How do you make a safe space for that? I would, I would, you know, I would actually, I, 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 when I've approached, there's some people when I tell them about my interest in this and coming here and learning this, they, African Americans, white people, but definitely a lot of African Americans like don't want to like no, like that's interesting. You want to do that? There is no way. Like it's just a major taboo. I think in a lot of cultures, not just African American, but like migration stories, like people are leaving for a reason. You know, like I had an ex boyfriend who was Armenian. Like he would not, his family would not talk about their family history, and he never pushed it. You know, like it's just something you just don't talk about. Um, so I, I would give people space and. Um, I would ask like maybe some initial like, you know, when you're around people, a, a situation you, you're curious about, like trying to get a story from or seeing if somebody's interested, like ask like baby <laughs> questions, <laughs> you know, like don't, because you, you know, just be careful because it, it has been traumatizing. Even like I'm a storyteller and I love talking about this, but like um, this is relating to a question that somebody asked, like what are your reactions you get like when you come to Kentucky? Like I've had people say some of the most horrible things that make me wish I never did any of this. <laughs> So, you know, because, you know, people will be like, um, you know, you know, well, first of all, they'll deny or that they'll, you know, they'll just tell me like why like, the other day, like Black Lives Matter, you know, like how horrible it is and like, and tell me, you know, and like relate it to like my, I don't know. It's just like, you just got to be careful. Like, <laughs> you know, just how you just approach people. I know people aren't going to do like stuff like that here, but like, it's just, very like and seemingly innocuous questions sometimes could be like a, a serious landmine. So just be, be very careful and like approach gingerly, I think, you know, but it can be done. It's just, you know, I, I remember when I told the moth in, in Omaha, that was traumatizing. I almost wish I didn't go, but I'm glad I did go because like these two girls did come up to me who are mixed race and they started crying and we're all crying because they don't know that they didn't have that many black people and they wanted to know their history because they actually weren't in touch with that African-American family um, parent. And, um, you know, so they said that I helped see, help them see themselves. But then I had another person that show it was like me and there was um, a, a man from the Shawnee nation and we we're talking and uh, he was in the show and this guy came up to us and he said, you know, to the guy, um, you know, I'm sorry, my family, we did persecute your ancestors. And I just want to apologize for that. And he turned to me, he's like, but my family didn't do anything to your people. So we're good. And it was just like, both of us were just sitting there. Like he just like threw up on both of us. It was just kind of like, that's not, you know, like just because people want to tell stories, like you really have to think about who you're talking to. So yeah, just like, just approach gingerly. And then um, if you meet people who are really open, I would say pursue that, you know. Thanks. Yes, it's all, it's, it's challenging. And it's also, um, I think one of the last questions that was coming up here <clears throat> is sort of also your uh, telling your whole family story. So your responsibility there as a storyteller. So does that like not talk about it feeling pass as older generations pass or is it related to lots of other things? Wait, can you repeat the question again? Like, does that not talk about it like that sort oh. of we shouldn't talk about this stuff oh, we're not talking about stuff yeah um yeah now it does seem like people are more comfortable like it's there's like that like you know that one article i was telling about the pet family member who died it was a, an article about a guy a family member who we found out was passed well the news found out was passing for white and he, it was in that when they it came out when he died and like it was ended up being in the New York Times, Time Magazine at that time. This is in 1932, everywhere. It was, and actually working on a, pro a project about that. It was literally everywhere. And like, 
my ancestors, I had relatives and my mom knew, who, who knew this person, like now that she knows, she knows that now, but like nobody talked about it, you know, like, and, but she knew, like she even, yeah, she knew all about his siblings, but never even heard his name, <laughs> you know? So I think like now people are, I think like as time is passing, it's just kind of like, you got, also have to realize like when a library, what is it when someone passes away, it's like a library closes, like you, you want, you need to hold on to your stories. And like a part of my whole thing with dealing with memory and migration, like a lot of these things, these fractured memories, people moving forward and cutting off the past, you know, one, it's like not fully healing. You know, you're just covering something up. You're just burying stuff. You're not healing at all. You're just pushing yourself forward by forgetting, but you're still, you're still damaged in some way. And two, like you're also forgetting and cutting off the wonderful stories too. Cause we had, I mean, I didn't know like had ancestors who went to Berea college in 1863. I mean, in um, yeah, 1868, you know and like all these other people who do these incredible things they cut that part of their lives off, you know? And um, I just think, I think yeah, yeah, family members now are just, I think they're super proud. Nice. Well, I want to thank you so much because as you know, I am a huge fan. I, I, did, I heard you on the moth and um, it impacted my work.